Newsflash, your onboarding program is essential for employee morale, productivity, and retention. What are some things that set good onboarding apart from great onboarding? You know, we had that question too. So today, the nerds welcome Kurt Tufert, a sales development vice president who focuses in on using various tools to aid in the onboarding process and training. Kurt has been pioneering outside-the-box onboarding experiences for his employees, and he's here to share some amazing best practices and stories. We all took notes on this episode. I'm sure you will learn a thing or two as well. Let's get started. They are the fabulous learning nerds. Because if you're tired of the old ways of getting it done, you've got the fabulous learning nerds. Scott, Dan, and Abby are making it fun. The best ideas that you've ever heard. So everybody spread the word. They're going to keep you with learning the fabulous learning nerds. Fabulous learning nerds. Oh, yeah. Hey, folks, welcome back to another fantastic episode of your Fabulous Learning Nerds. I'm Scott Judy, your host, and with us every week, back again, you love him, Dan Coonrod. Dan the man. Oh, yeah. Mr. Coonrod. Mr. Shooty. How you doing, Scott? How am I doing? How are Fear you? to Midland. I stole your drop. I well, did crap. it. I, I did I, it. I, I don't. I don't know how I'm doing now. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. How lost. are you doing? I guess I'm okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll there take the be, okay. There can't be too fair to Midlands. It's. I don't know. It's no. like matter and antimatter. It's just. It's not. It's not. No. Good. You can. That would that be a bad thing. Be the end of this podcast. <laughs> there are many things that should have destroyed this podcast, but that would be it. The fair to Midland coming together. Yeah. Ah, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Is- right. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the yes. way it goes. <laughs> that's a deep cut. All right. <laughs> hey, let's get off the Ghostbusters track. Let's introduce our other co host. You love her, Miss uh, Abby Dawson's with us. Abby. <laughs> Abby. Hey, Scott. How you doing? I'm good. I'm a little worried about Dan. I mean, I feel like we threw him off kilter right at the start. What are we going to do? Know. To help him? <laughs> I know. How is he going to recover? But maybe this uh, is good. You know, this is how growth happens, Dan. Meh. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> Everybody, you can't see it, but Dan's got the biggest who moved my cheese look on his face, <laughs> which is a very deep cut for a book <laughs> that I read in the 90s, right? Like, who moved my cheese? Give me a break. Scott's in a deep cut kind of mood. Have you? This is like, we've heard several references that he says, that's a deep cut just today. I know, right? I better stop. Well, we no. better quit while we're ahead. How are you doing, Abby? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I'm tickled to sit and talk to you guys this morning. So, best part of my week, best part of my day. It's going to be fantastic, uh, folks. We are super excited because we have a very special guest with us today, um, and uh, he's going to talk to us all about sales training and onboarding, which is a big part of what Abby and I, our experience and background is, and. and we're going to get to know all about uh, Mr. Kurt Tufert with a little se- segment that we call What's Your Deal? Hey, man. What's your deal? Kurt. Good morning. What's your deal, man? What is my deal? Well, I'm a, you know, recently out of prison. This is great. I, the ankle bracelet's a little chafing on me, but that's okay. Uh, it's great to be in general population again. This has been wonderful. <laughs> That might be the best intro. Scott, have we had one better? No. That's solid. That's I, amazing. I didn't think that you couldn't do a podcast from prison, <laughs> to be honest with you. So we could have had Kurt on weeks ago. But I'm glad you're recently out because it's going to lead to really great energy, you know, you as, I, as I think. No, seriously, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your journey and uh, what brought you here today. You bet. You bet. So so I'm a VP of sales development for a industrial distributor here in Houston, Texas. Uh, we've been around for a hundred over 100 years. And I started as the VP of sales for Houston. And then I got moved into more of a training and development role. And my background is, uh, gosh, it's, it's pretty eclectic from a professional speaker, author. Uh, I still uh, teach a class at the University of Houston in the summers and doing all of this developmental work in order to help 
very egotistical uh, sales professional convince themselves that training is still relevant for them. Because as you know, they're the smartest people in the room 24 seven. Yeah. Um, the toughest people to train in my humble opinion. Right. Agreed. Um, yeah. So it'll be really interesting to, to hear about that. Um, what got you into uh, sales development? I know that's kind of a new hot thing, right? Um, this whole world of sales and enablement sales development. Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I, they hired me, they, the company hired me about 17 years ago because I came off the road as a professional sales trainer. They thought they could spin all that into a very fast growing company. And then what had happened was we started hitting, hitting our stride. We created a, a billion dollars in sales. We had a sales force of over 200 outside and 220 inside salespeople. And we just didn't have any kind of consistent training. So we decided to moved me into a role that allowed me to do this face-to-face -face training. And then I started to move into other tools like a learning management system, uh, doing some audio interviews, anything I could possibly do to en enhance the experience of outside salespeople driving in cars and trucks and not having anything to listen to. And then that moved into the whole realm of the entire uh, employee population, which is over 2,500, and offering them some courses that would give them either professional development or personal development. So I'm that I'm that wannabe guy that's uh, not smart enough to be Tony Robbins and, uh, and not dead yet to be uh, Jim Rohn or Zig Ziglar. <laughs> but you're a maverick, which I love, right? So this opportunity to come in and I'm going to try something new which I think if you want to be successful and dare I say happy in this world of learning and development, you have to have this passion of if it ain't broke, break it. So I'm super excited to, uh, to learn more about that and hear more about your journey as we uh, dive into um, our topic of the week, folks. Let's go ahead and let's dive into that. Hey, topic of the week this week, folks, we're going to be talking about the importance of onboarding, um, which I think is more important today than it ever has been before. So I'm really excited to have Kurt here to talk a little bit about his experience with onboarding and his understanding about onboarding and what he's doing in his world to make it better. So take it away, Kurt. Talk to us a little bit about onboarding. Thanks, Scott. We, we came up with onboarding not as a, on our own. Uh, we did a lot of exit interviews to find out why are outside salespeople leaving our company. And a lot of it was because they just didn't feel that there was any place for them. They didn't have any foundation to build off of. So when I started the onboarding process, I knew that it was very difficult to bring in salespeople from outside of the Houston area into Houston, time away from their family, time away from the territory, the expense of travel. So I held quarterly onboarding courses in the greater Houston area, and that was pretty successful for those people. However, I wanted to take it a step further. And so I created an opportunity where each time a new outside salesperson would come into our company, I would get their home address from our human resource department, and then I would put them in a campaign where as soon as they were hired, and I got their home address, they would automatically get a card written by the president delivered to their home address, welcoming them to the company. And then a week and a half later, they would get something from me. Uh, it's a customized water bottle with their name on it and a card welcoming them. And then a week and a half after that, they'd get a third card. A week and a half after that, they'd get a another product, a custom business card holder with their name laser engraved in it. And then at the end, they'd get another card from me. Each one of the cards on the back had a little bit more of, hey, welcome, now that you're here, check out our online learning. Hey, welcome, now that you're here, have you checked out the DXP Sales Gym? Hey, welcome, now that you're here, did you know you can take these courses online and trade the points for swag? And all of that information was dripped to their home address so everyone in their family could rally around, hey, mom or dad, brother or sister, they all got a new job. And wow, this company is flooding them with all of this love, if you will. So that helped create some stickiness 
for that first 90 day experience. I love that, Kurt, because I'll tell you, salespeople know what it is to be wooed. They know how to woo people. They understand motivations behind it. And I think you really hit the nail on the head. You let them be the hero at home. You let them putting their name on something like people don't understand <laughs> the, the uh, significance of of people recognizing that they're an individual and not just um, part of like a machine that just goes out and makes money for the bigger business. Um, well, it seems a, small, but it's so important. There's a subliminal message to that, Abby. As they receive all this information at home, yes, they're wooed. But then I turn it on them and I say, hey, this same tool you can use as a sales professional to woo prospects and customers. And tragically, um, they, they either don't get it or I'm in the industrial distribution space where men are just a little awkward when it comes to giving another man a thank you card or a box of brownies. It, it's been an epic fail on my part uh, for some, but it's been a heroic success for the guys who connect and say, wait a minute, how much does this cost? It's free. It's part of the deal. Oh, and then your next thing I know, it's like, oh my gosh, I sent this person brownies and they raved on it and I got another purchase order. Well, there you have it. These little clever things in onboarding, to your point, it's the woo factor. Mm -hmm. And when they do come to Houston, the onboarding experience is all about meeting and networking and pouring into their craniums as much enthusiasm about what we do as well as the connection. Here are the leaders. Here are the thought leaders of the company. Here are the department and division heads. We all get together, do some presentations. At night, we go out and have uh, drinks and get some networking in them. And then for the sales guy, and, and this is kind of fun and clever, on the third day, they come to class and it's different. I changed the dynamic of the class. Instead of classroom, there are uh, a table and four chairs in the front. And this is now called Shark Tank. I get some of the local Houston sales reps and they are sitting as customers and prospects. And the onboarding class has to stand and deliver a 30 second commercial and then start getting peppered by questions from the sharks. And all the questions are based on everything they've learned in that two day experience. And then whoever answers the questions right or with passion and excellence, they get scored. The person with the highest score gets a $500 gift card. And it's open to everyone in the onboarding. So yes, it started with outside salespeople, but I've got people in accounting, people in warehouse, people in inventory management, and they all have a desire to participate in the Shark Tank experience. I love that. I love that it's not just salespeople. That's great. Uh, procedure you're talking about sounds suspiciously a lot like good training. <laughs> I mean, this is this is awesome. <laughs> like you're talking about like just a building an experience and I'm like, I'm a huge, huge proponent as a guy. I love to get brownies. So anytime somebody's trying to woo me and convince me like, Hey, like I'm definitely the company you want to work with, uh, building an experience and brownies is definitely one of those deciding factors for me. And so doing that for, for training, uh, I'm a huge proponent of experiential learning and just building experiences rather than training. That's awesome. Dan, I, yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, you would be surprised on how some of the salespeople suck at the Shark Tank experience because they're just not used to a 30 second commercial. They're just they're just not those people. And then there's people who are not in sales, who are extroverts, who can articulate and they can woo those four sharks to the point of they could win the contest. And that is an epic fail to the sales guys. And it's an epic win that says, look, you can do this. You don't have to be in that club. And it's so exciting to do that. Well, That's and I awesome. love that it builds compassion across the business. Um, I've, I've seen so often where sales is just othered. Um, people don't understand what they do. Sales feels like they don't have an inroad to the rest of the business or any compassion for the, from the rest of the business. Um, activities like that where there's overlap go a long way in, in, in building those roads and relationships. Agreed. I, Abby, I totally understand what you're saying. And, and that's that other concept, you know, they, 
they're they're the elite ones. They're the ones on a variable compensation plan, blah, blah, blah. And yet I try to echo the fact that from the onboarding class, we offer 96 hours of formal classroom training if they want it. I, I, I created a negotiation class and a presentation class, and we have a two-day uh, sales training class. And, and all of these things are, are out there that allow them to move that. I, I, I can take those courses into the regions so that the regions can have localized training and it doesn't require them to travel all the way to Houston. So I, I try to make this thing as palatable as possible uh, with, without the, the bribery of brownies. <laughs> well, I certainly will take as many brownies as I can get, right? <laughs> especially if you're making them in Colorado or select other states. But at any rate, you know, one of the things that I would want to do is I want to talk to our non-sales audience for just a second. And then, Kurt, I'm going to ask you to back up for just a minute. So, folks, as we think about some of these things that Kurt's mentioned, right, we talk about, hey, I get a welcome letter, right? And it's not just a welcome letter from anybody. I, it's signed by important and influential people, right? Um, and then we, I get a, uh, I get a learning experience that that defines company culture, but also challenges me to think outside of the box and makes me feel really important. Like you don't have to be designing and developing, delivering those experiences for sales organizations. I do really they it, they apply to any organization, and I and I feel like the the real impact and the real meat of what I know that Kurt has to share with us today is the real intrinsic value especially today around that onboarding experience. And I will admit that I haven't had great ones at all. And I, I really, Kurt, could you, you and I are talking a little bit before the show about um, you were on a panel and some things you learned about. Could you talk to our audience a little bit about the, why this is so important, especially in a post pandemic world where a lot of people are getting their onboarding experiences, not in a huge office, but maybe in a closet somewhere in, in their own home. Great, great. I will, Scott. And and I had the privilege to be on the Texas A&M uh, board. We had an economic development council board just to determine how these college students uh, in the last three or four years, what was their experience as they left college and moved into the big world of, uh, of adulthood, if you will. And we talked a lot about the onboarding experience and not everyone was in sales. Many of these people were in an operations role or an accounting role. And we started listening for the best practices, the, the ability to take someone who is preferably working remote and, and, and to give them, whether it's an LMS system, which seems to be one good and powerful vehicle, caveat being the delivery method, method is great. But if the content sucks, then the onboarding experience will be bad. But there's, there's, there's mentoring that was huge that when you get onboarded into a new company, whether you're remote or whether you're right there, that you're associated with a team, kind of a team that develops your first 30, 60, 90 days. You get a mentor assigned to you that helps you. And this mentor is conditioned, interviewed. They have a heart of a teacher. You just don't show up and say, Mike is a mentor, let's go. No, you have to interview into that program because you want somebody who wants the other person to succeed to have that experience, to when they're frustrated, to call their mentor and say, look, I'm really confused. I don't understand what this means or who is this person or why is it that I never can get my emails returned or whatever it would be, the mentoring, the teaming. Uh, some other companies will put them into teams based on animals. You, you know, you're on the Eagle team and you're on the Rhino team and then it just allows a little bit of camaraderie and a little bit of likeness. Hey, we're like each other. All these things don't require a tremendous amount of expense and investment. They just require a want to and a can do. I love that for a lot of reasons, Scott, I hope I didn't step on you, but um, I have joined companies before where the idea is like, you're supposed to connect to your team and your leader, and there's no real effort made outside of that. And I think it's so important to have somebody outside of that immediate group who you owe things to, who you report to. Um, someone who's just there to support you <laughs> and doesn't need anything from you necessarily. Um, I think it makes a huge difference. And to feel like you just have someone who's a safe place to, to talk. Well, I just think that the dynamics of our, our um, workforce have changed so dramatically 
especially if you think about the Generation Z people growing up. I was at a conference um, last year, or actually, I shouldn't say last year, but you know, when we could go out and actually be with people, uh, 2019. And I think the data is probably skewed a little bit even tighter. Um, and Kurt, you could either agree or, or not agree, or maybe you got a bit more um, relevant, even more impactful information. What I discovered or what I was told is that the average tenure for Gen Z was 18 months, which is insane to me. Like, I, 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 you know, I'm a little older, like, no way that makes no sense. But it actually does if you think about how these folks were raised, right? So I was raised with parents that told me that I was special. I was raised to believe that everybody that participated got a trophy. I, I was raised to believe that I had value. And then we go into corporate America and I'm given a desk and a chair and a handbook. And that's it. And um, when I quickly learned that, and maybe I don't have value, um, then I begin to look for someplace else where I do. And that's where I think that it's really key for those onboarding um, practices that you've been talking about to really try to create this place where, yeah, you know what? Your, um, your impact to the business is important and um, you add value. And we're going to, we're going to create a home here for you where you can learn and grow and, and, um, and add value to the business. Um, but anyway, that, that's what I learned. Did you learn anything uh, different or anything you may want to add to that? Yeah, you know, I appreciate that uh, that segue. We learned in our uh, Texas A&M talent management group, 18 to 24 months is the aha factor. Whether it's, you know, we're, we're, we're competing with people who are uh, assimilating knowledge so quickly on these little black rectangles called mobile devices. They're grown to that. They do that. And, and, and they want to be president in 28 months. And everything is a flight risk for them. Um, sometimes they get their feelings hurt really, really quickly, and they don't know how to process that. So then they just pop out on Indeed or Glassdoor, and then they go to another place. Uh, we see that turnover a lot. And, and here's the challenge is how do I approach uh, an organization with HR or sales or operations and explain to them the value of onboarding and training and development if their immediate response is, what does it matter, Kurt? They're going to leave in 18 to 24 months anyway. And, and I go, well, what matters is you'll never retain your A players. You'll settle for B plus players or C minus players. And that's going to be the reputation of your company. You cannot compete in a marketplace. Now, today, the craziness, in addition to the 18 to 24 month window, is these meteoric salary requirements. <laughs> you know, you, you get a guy from college who's poured beer for four summers and, you know, they want this incredible salary. And I'm like, well, well <laughs> it's hard for me to pay you that kind of money when all you see on the resume is, is you know, I played, you know, Pong and, you know, that's what I did every summer, but I got good grades. We're really challenged in learning and development. We they're looking to us, they being the community, to give them the magic, the, the solution, the equation that solves all retention problems. And, and maybe the three of you have it and you just haven't shared it with the audience yet. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the hopper. We've got it coming, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Yeah. Happy to from hello. Yeah. 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 I think. I think you hit the nail on the head, though, about how hard it is to help the rest of the business understand what we can and we can't do, what we need from them, um, and how hard it is to reach the people who are coming in. Like that balance, you said they have such huge egos, and they do, and some of them are justified and some of them aren't. But um, how, what have you done to try and find that balance of we want to give you a lot of help and show you that we have a lot to offer, but also we understand you're coming in with some skills and talent. And we don't want to assume that you can't do things. Mm. For me, for some of the things we've done is, it, we, you know, there is a, um, there's a document you can create. I, I, I used to teach this a lot before I was working full time. It, it's, this is what we expect in the first day, the first week, the first 30 days, the first 60 days, the first 90 days. And it's a document that you can give to that new person and you can have some kind of touch base meetings, touch base with them at the end of the first week of the first month, kind of review that checklist. And, and I get a quick indicator on anyone I hire, whether they're 60 or 26, 
hey, how are you doing on that checklist? If I hear what checklist, that's a good indicator that they're not going to work out. If I get, well, I know it's 30 days, but I'm already done with uh, the first 90 days. That's a different indicator. Um, I give breadcrumbs, which is here's the login and password to our learning and development system. We call it DXP University. Have you signed up any courses? Are you actively learning? There's just something about a learner who goes out there and does a little bit of self-management that gives me an indicator that their compass is pointing north. And, and tragically, you know, I want to be the nurturer. I want to give everybody the participation award, but they're still first and second place. And when you're in second place, that, that means you're the first loser. And, and, and that's cruel and unusual punishment. But in the sales environment, that's where we go. But in the ops environment and accounting and all that, I, I want to give them a chance and I give them these tools. If they don't pick up what we're laying down, you know, I don't know how to do it. I can't do it. I don't want to. If I can't do it, I can train that. If I don't know how, I can train that. But if I won't do it, that's a behavioral thing and that that could cause messy problems. I was really intrigued with your Shark Tank example um, because they get such a great example of outside the box learning, right? And I always want to look for opportunities of the, I'm going to, disrupt the apple cart right i'm walking in i'm gonna expect i'm gonna get the sage on the stage and be bored to death for a, a day and you you upset the apple cart do you have any other examples where you've applied the creative outside of the box approach to to learning and then um, talk to us a little bit about some of the impacts of that? sure uh, we, we sometimes experiment on these onboarding classes where we'll give them a group assignment and maybe it's three o'clock in the afternoon and we know we're gonna break at 4.30. And so we'll divide them into groups and we'll give them a problem to solve. Okay, the problem is marketing. You've heard about marketing, they came in this morning. Now, based on what you've heard, get into a group and determine how are we gonna market X? Or you've heard about uh, the person in this division department, how would you, if resources were unlimited, how would you do Y? And then they go off and they collaborate for about 25 minutes and they come back and then they present what they have uh, discovered. And the beauty of that is, is it's an eclectic group of people. It's outside sales, it's accounting, it's inventory management. It's all kind of different people. And we purposely randomize those groups. So everybody gets a little bit of a chance to do that. Um, in some of my on uh, my face-to-face -face classes, we do a lot of... Um, breakaways, breakouts, come back, do that. And it's been fun because there's no right answer. Uh, there's no right way of doing something. It's just the experience that I want to talk about and how that experience and what you brought to the group can sustain you when you leave here and you go back into your regional offices and do the work you do. Um, because of the pandemic, we had to do something. We couldn't bring them in. So we created what I would call uh, connection training. And it's kind of onboarding in, in live Zoominars. And then we would I would take that one and I would edit it and make it a little bit more palatable, a little bit funner and send that out there. And so if you're not coming to Houston, but you're in Boston, you're in Key West, Florida, you're in Anaheim, California, you can do some of this onboarding and it's not, oh crap, this is the worst experience of my life. I'd rather be cut a thousand times with a sheet of paper. It's kind of fun. It has some reward to it. We're just trying to open our mind up to anything and everything to keep all these Gen Zers as well as older people engaged. I love the term Zoominar. That's, that, that's new to me. I'm writing that down. <laughs> it's a Zoominar, folks. I think that's great. And the students um, are Zoomers. <laughs> When Kurt, I have it, you seen? Yeah, you know, when I teach at the University of Houston during the pandemic, it was a bunch of Zoomers. But now we can we can bifurcate that, and we have a couple of people in the classroom, and then the Zoomers online. The Zoomers go to chat; they ask a question. It's disruptive, but it works. Kurt, have you seen um, with your onboarding everyone engaging with different groups and teams? Has that carried through? Do they continue that behavior as they go into the business over the next few months? Oh, Abby, how do I answer this without getting fired? Um, <laughs> Don't get fired. Yeah, so, yeah. 
So not everybody manages to my expectation. Um, we don't really do a lot of manage the managers and coach the coaches. So sometimes they get this, uh, you know, Wizard of Oz experience in Houston. And gosh, Kurt, you're so dynamic. You're funny. You've got goofy comments. And then they go back out to the drudgery of where they're at with a manager that doesn't share my passion and enthusiasm. And tragically, it could be beaten out of them in the first week coming back. So we, we try. We, we know the cliche that people don't quit their company, they quit their manager. If there is truth to that, then we need to go to the root cause. What's the manager doing that's causing people to quit? On? Yeah, I don't think you're alone there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Abby. Pull me out of that, that, car, that car wreck, please. <laughs> you know, I... I I've, I've heard that a lot and I've seen it where people are in training and they're enamored with the experience. And then as soon as they hit like the real world, the really real, like everything starts to fall apart. And uh, too often I hear people say, well, you know, you guys are just too nice to him in training or you guys are just, you know, you're not showing them what it's really like. And, you know, you, you talk, that's how we started this conversation about experiences. And again, it's like in training, we know we have to build an experience. Kurt, you know how to build an experience, but, and that's not something that just happens naturally. I think too many managers and, and too many coaches and supervisors, they, they don't know how to build an experience. They have other pressures on them and the idea of like, oh, I got to take time and manage like expectations, or I have to take time and do this. And then on top of that, I've got to build something so people feel like they're valued and respected. Well, they get a paycheck. That's enough. And then like, as soon as you boil down everybody's contributions to a paycheck, they'll start looking for other paychecks, easy peasy. And to your point, Daniel, uh, we had this Skunk Works uh, experience. Uh, we had a couple of operational managers start creating a leadership development course, unsupported, unfunded, just on their own. And uh, it became so dynamic, so popular. And this is the brilliance of the gentleman who, who led it at the very end the 12 people had to do kind of a 15 minute TED talk experience about what they learned in this leadership development council. And they invited the president and the senior management staff on the Zoom call just to observe. That went so viral that uh, now everybody wants to be in the next one in April. And I just smiled thinking, you know, you did it. You, you, you did this without support or, you know, acknowledgement. And then at the end, you got some amazing feedback. And and I don't know, I hope in every company around, you know, this podcast and to the listeners ears, that they think about what can we do outside of, I'm waiting for my manager to turn on the lights and train me. Man, I, I just, I didn't, I couldn't do that. I had to create goofy things. I started with um, just tape recording, uh, people who are interesting in the industry. And this is before podcasts became popular. And then, then it led to podcasts and then it led to online training, whether it's recorded Zoom or voiceover PowerPoint. And it's in bite-sized chunks. I don't think any of my courses uh, typically exceed 18 to 22 minutes just because the adult attention span is, is so small. Um, it's viral, I hope. And I, I think the four of us on this call, we all struggle to provide the right tool at the right time to get those managers excited again. Yeah, I think key, though, um, is this idea of inspecting what what we expect, right? So i been there, done that, done the, done the uh, dog and pony show for a large organization. And I'm almost like, oh, I'm so happy to be here, only to come back to that location and go, why can't everybody be like you, right? And um, so you have that disappoint. But if we're not inspecting what we expect from our leadership, then we're just going to get the same. And I think, I think slow. The thing that I'm encouraged about the dynamic of what we're seeing in the workplace today is that I think that a lot of organizations are waking up to that fact. Like if I'm going to steward human capital, right? So if you're going to give me people, like that becomes like the most important piece of my job. Right. And I have to be equipped to do it right. Number one. And number two, I need to be held to a standard um, of uh, these people need to grow and add more. Right. Because that's what that's my job. My job is to improve their performance so that um, they deliver better results for the organization. 
And um, so, you know, that's not easy. Uh, and I'm super excited to hear that, that people are going out and kind of, you know, guerrilla training and, and creating an environment where people can get excited about that. But the real traction is going to be when the organization as a whole says, yeah, this is important and we're going to hold people to that, to that standard. And until we as a society get to that point of, yeah, um, people leadership and the, and the tenets and the competencies around people leadership are important, um, I think we're going to continue to see the 18-month aha moment of, hey, you know, we're there. So that's, that's interesting. I didn't mean to preach. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm picking up what you're laying down, man. That's, that is amazing. It's, it's true. It's the tone at the top. It's, it's what is being articulated, you know, don't do as I say, do as I do. Well, hmm. There's just so much we can do. And, and, and all the great companies are featured in the good to great books and all those un other wonderful books. And then everybody else, we just struggle because uh, we take people, we promote them into management. We don't give them any tools and we just have them go out there. And there really isn't an inspect what we expect so much as it's just pound the numbers, right? We're driven by a matrix or a metrics that uh, just demands productivity. And I think sometimes people are like, no, nah, I'm just going to punch out. And they, yeah. uh, they punch out in that 18 to 24 month window. The analogy that I'm going to use, I'm going to share with the audience just is, you know, you think about great coaches, great sport coaches. I'm going to go sports. And okay. Cliche, right? Your great coaches are not looking at the scoreboard. They're looking at the performers on the field, doing whatever they need to do, right? And so the ones that we remember are all those ones that take a look at the gap between what a person is capable of and where they're actually performing today. And if we can close that gap, we're going to get the wins that we need. And I think that that's just something that I would, if you are blessed, and I think that you are, those people who are blessed to have direct reports and you're stewarding human capital, I mean, that's really where it's at. How do I shrink that gap, right? and or identify if we've got a talent opportunity, right? So did this person get miscast? Happens all the time. How do we find a place for them where they can be successful so they can meet the needs of the business and professionally grow, which I think is great. Um, I love this idea of ask for forgiveness, right? So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Cause like it, earlier last year, I was in the same place. Like I have this really wonderful idea and I put together this great presentation and we you know, floated it up to senior leadership and they're like, I don't get it. <laughs> and so we just didn't do it. Um, talk to me a little bit about about doing more of, of that, this this idea of we know it's the right thing. No one's really given us permission to do it. So we're just going to go out there and do it. And then what kind of results that we get from that? You know, uh, I don't think that's taught as much. If we were to do some kind of a uh, uh, a survey about ask for forgiveness, not permission, that's something in a culture gone by. I don't hear that term too, too much in the 35 and under crowd. And so I, I get a lot of go along to get along kind of stuff. I'm that person that likes to break the mold. I'll do a book club or I'll do an audio this or I'll, I'll ask for that forgiveness and I'll, and I'll fail more times than I succeed. And, and I can just look back at a string of failures in the last two years about trying to do things that would help. Um, for instance, <laughs> this ask for forgiveness, not permission when I did this DXP University and I, and I started a different concept called the DXP sales gym. And the metaphor was go into the virtual gym, the online LMS and work out, go take a, a, a sales course or a negotiating course or something of that nature, work out and get points. And then later on, you can trade those points in for this in the swag catalog in the DXP sales gym store. And there was personalized mugs and, 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 and barbecue sets and charcuterie boards and all this great stuff. Nobody wanted to buy anything. So I had to send a survey out to the top guys. I'm like, hey, you got 500 points. How come you're not buying things? And their answer was, I don't want to give up my points to get the product. And I said, oh, my gosh, I totally missed the mark on that one. Um, and so I said, so what if I gave you the product and you'd still be on the leaderboard, your name would be in lights and that started the products to flow. Um, I definitely asked for forgiveness because obviously when you exchange these points for an actual product, there's a cost associated with that. And I just put it on the expense report until somebody said, Hey, 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 what's this? Well, there's my forgiveness. Hey, I went through this 
Johnny took 18 courses. Johnny has a high probability of being a little smarter now. And it cost us a personalized coffee mug. Oh, okay. But if I would have gone through the proposal and gone to the leadership, who would have gone to their leadership, who would have gone to the top of the organization, there would have been 19 reasons why this would have never worked. But I'm wired for asking for forgiveness, not permission. Scott, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's taught anymore or as much. And so therein lies some of that challenge. Okay, I'm going to challenge you on that. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. And then I want to ask him about something too. <laughs> okay, great. I'm just going to challenge you to change your thought process around failure because you've learned so much, right? Yes. It is an old failure if we learn. Of, right? of course. So we, I mean, yeah. what's the cliche, Ben? What, Edison, you know, he failed a thousand times to make the light bulb type thing. I, I encourage my people to fail, but learn quickly. You know, if they don't learn quickly and we're just failing and not learning, um, then we have an opportunity. I am suspicious um, that you're already good at this, but um, we hear a lot of folks and we we've also chirped in on, on our podcast before. Go ahead and try and fail. But I think there's there's more um, sophistication to it than sometimes people think about. So it sounds like when you were going into a situation, you were going to ask for forgiveness on where there was a potential one that you would get in trouble and two that it would just fail. How do you approach that? So, and what I'm trying to get at is, how do you measure what harm you may cause and decide that it's worthwhile? Oh, good, hard question. Um, I guess I measure things based on the adoption rate from the adults. Is it something that people are going to adopt that I could take a failure and turn it into a success? Or is it just so completely a train wreck that it's going to damage my ego, my career, my, my promotability in the company? Um, and so a lot of what Scott says about failing and learning, yeah, I, I failed with a lot of these things, but I learned from them. Um, there are some, and I have to pick the right battles at the right times. A, a couple of years ago, we were going through a tough recession in industrial distribution in the industrial market. And I wasn't going to go roll up and go ask for money to go do something. Other times things are moving in the right direction. I'm getting a couple of little wins, maybe a couple of emails back. Hey, Kurt, thank you for this. It really helped me. And I can take that and add it to the, hey, based on what I'm hearing in the field, I'm going to go off in this direction. And if I don't hear back, that tells me that's a yes. And so I, I, I proceed forward. But all of that is the way I'm wired, Abby. I'm that sales guy that if you say, if you call me up one more time, I'm going to rip your arm off and beat you over the head with it. I'll call you right back and ask you, <laughs> were you just kidding? I mean, I'm that guy and that's an annoying guy, but it it, it gets. This is awesome. I, I 100% uh, agree with the asking for forgiveness. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've been like, well, well let's just do it. What's the worst that happens? And then to find myself in a meeting later on with a leader and being like, okay, so here's what's the worst thing that happened. <laughs> but like, it's better to have like, take that initiative and you're right. Sometimes like the speed of business is um, glacial and like, you got to move and talk about retaining talent. And sometimes that requires decisions that need to be made right there and then. Yeah, no. Sing, singing my song. I love it. Yeah, for me, I think it's really important, though. Like, I'm not, I don't want to tell everybody to go out there and do wild and crazy stuff and then get in trouble. So, like, that's not where I'm at. I do. Like, I think, no. But, <laughs> well, no, I think that I think that you have to take a look at, you know, I understand my audience, right? I understand where they're at. Uh, I'm going to take a calculated risk. It's not going to take that much time and energy and effort to do. And then we're going to take a look at the results after that, and we're going to share it out. Dan, you and I talked about um, the podcast that you created, right? So you did a sales podcast. You guys created that. And I believe that was grassroots, correct? Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Like, we were like, let's yeah, yeah, do yeah. this. Yeah. Nobody, no, yeah. You just went out and did what you knew was the right thing. And then share with our audience what happened um, after that. Oh, yeah, sure. So I, I will say, like, we, we made a few episodes. Uh, so originally, I was like, hey, we want to make a podcast. And my, there was a lot of reluctance from my leadership at first. Like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
And so I went to the person who originally had this idea and I was like, hey, I need you to build me like a 30 second stinger. Like, just go and make it. Like, oh, are you sure? I'm positive. And then we made the 30 second stinger and like my, my leadership immediately was like, this is amazing. We need more of this. And I'm like, awesome. I'm glad you think so. And then they're like, how many episodes are you going to build? And we we're like, ah, probably like 10. And they're like, oh, that's a lot. Like, let's start, let's start with just like one. Like, all right, great. And then, so we went out and made three and, uh, you know, it was just like, well, who are you going to interview? Well, we're going to interview these people. Like, oh, okay, great. And then of course we reached out immediately to VPs of the, of the company. Like, Hey, we want you on this podcast, talk about sales. So like <clears throat> every step of the way was like, uh, I was given an inch and I took a mile <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's an amazing podcast. It's an, it was an amazing product. It was one of those things that I'm so proud to have been part of having seen it come together. And sure enough, like, you know, as I transitioned uh, out of that role to a different place, they were talking about, okay, great. How do we do season two, just like season one? How do we keep this going? How do we keep making this? And it became an important part of uh, the sales culture of, of the company there. Hey, Kurt, we're getting close to that time where we're going to need to start winding things down. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to go ahead and talk a little bit about maybe some things that were really important that you wanted to share that you didn't have time to talk about yet. So, you know, some final thoughts from you when it comes to onboarding and creativity, you know, things that were really important to you. Well, you know, one of the things that was important was to to circle back to the people who have gone through the courses. And so I'll do a, a survey. 30 days afterwards, and I'll just touch base to see what did they learn, what did they apply, what questions might they have. And then I, I add that, I add all their names into our monthly newsletter that goes out. And sometimes I'll capture a quote or a quip, something nice, and I'll and I'll put that in there. I think anytime we we do these onboarding classes or we do this coaching mentoring, we've got to do an ROI. We've got to get that return on investment by echoing back to the community. These things are happening. These things are working. Uh, I love what you said, Dan, about you know profiling these vice presidents about sales and do that. Uh, I try to do some of that as well. Uh, this clever, uh, what I use, uh, the, the service mailbox power that allows me to deliver these uh, products, customized products to the doorstep of the people. We've moved that into our service mechanics. This success moved to another operations group and they said, well, hey, Let's do that for those guys. So you get a service mechanic that starts with us. They're not expecting anything. They get the card from the president. They get a customized water bottle. Tragically, they'll show up at work holding that bottle. And then everybody else is like, hey, man, where'd you get that? It's got the logo, got your name on it. I don't have one of those. And now we got a viral um, fun problem to have on that one. So uh, I, I love automation. I love customization to make fe people feel like they're very special. Uh, you know, I think it was um, Mary Kay Ash, uh, the founder of uh, Mary Kay Cosmetics, who said everybody walks around with an invisible sign around their neck that says, make me feel important. And our job in learning and development is to make people feel important. And we do that through all the tools and talents and techniques we use. Well, Kurt, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your best practices, your uh, leadership, and just super creative ideas. And I wrote down notes, which I don't always do. So I've got notes from this, which is fantastic. Could you do us a favor? Could you let our audience know how they can connect more with you? Sure. Uh, I, my email address uh, is somewhere contained in the podcast is my last name. Uh, Tufert, T-U-E-F-F-E-R-T at AOL.com. And then the uh, the product that I use that I, I, I deliver with, uh, there's a URL, which is uh, I need your mailbox.com forward slash grow 2020. And that gets get gets a lot of activity and people who want to participate with that one. Uh, they'll get a card in the mail for me and they can see and experience what that would look like. And then please contact me. Uh, let's brainstorm. Let's reason together. Let's let's figure out ways that we can make your job in your learning and development environment better. Fantastic. Super great stuff. Reach out to him. I know that Kurt and I are buddies on uh, LinkedIn. You should certainly connect with him as well. Danielson. Yes, Scott. 
Could you do us a solid and let our audience know how they can connect with us? Absolutely. All right, party people. If you haven't already, hit us up at learningnerdscast at gmail.com. Email us any questions you might have. Join in on the discussion. We desperately want to hear from you. It would be fantastic. Tell us what your thoughts are on uh, taking a, a mile and giving an inch. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can find us at Learning Nerds. And lastly, for all of our Instagram folks, Fab Learning Nerds. Scott. Hey, thanks, Dan. Folks, if you could do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, share this podcast with your friends. We greatly appreciate it. If you're catching us on a podcatcher like Stitcher or iTunes, do us a solid. Leave us a review. It helps us know uh, how we can make the show better, and it helps us get our word out to more people. And with that, I'm Scott. I'm Dan. I'm Abby. I'm Kurt. And we're your fabulous learning nerds, and we are out. We'll be right back.